Have you ever had one of those ideas where you were pretty sure it was both crazy and ingenious at the same time? Well, welcome to LS 5.0. premise for this project came from an early behind the scenes discussion for the second LS vs Coyote shootout series. Now you might recall an Engine Labs article where I went in depth modeling the LS engine and the Coyote engine from the shootout in engine simulation software and then threw in the hypothetical 5 liter LS build only to have the results show that the displacement limited LS could not only make the power of the Coyote but do it in the same high RPM power band. After having those results scrutinized by some pretty advanced minds in the industry, they confirmed that not only did they believe it was possible, but that it would be a fun project. So after a couple of years grading on the higher ups, they finally gave in and signed off on the project in real life. LS 5.0 was born. Then 2020 happened. Our industry went haywire. Parts were on extended back order and nothing we needed was available. The science experiment stopped being top priority, and so it went on the back burner, slowly moving forward here and there. That brings us to where we are now. We have all the parts, we've done a ton of preparation, including upgrading the shop and our tools, and we're about to get this engine together and make a point. Or not, but I'm gonna think positive thoughts here. So what is LS 5.0, you might ask? Well, it's a five liter LS engine. The quick and dirty of it is that we hunted for a very specific core engine. That was a Gen 4 LY2 4.8 liter. We ended up getting the core from Pilot Engines, which is the engine remanufacturing side of Reviva Performance. We opened up the bores to 3.858 inches and kept the stock 3.267 inch crank. That comes out to 5.003 liters. You might be asking, why go through all the trouble of finding an LY2 when there's tons of LR4s just laying around? Well, the Gen 4 comes with a 58X reluctor wheel, and the LY2 comes with venerable 799 cylinder heads on top. From there, we partnered up with some of the biggest names in the industry to use some of the best off-the-shelf components, save for the pistons, those are custom, you can buy without breaking the bank. See, we're loosely following the rules set forth in the original LS vs Coyote shootout. No power adders, no exotic parts, combination needs to be streetable, and only have 11.3-ish to 1 compression. There's also the issue of a $10,000 budget, which I'm going to try to stay under, but I'm not going to hold myself to. My goal is to beat the modular from that test, in its power band, spinning to 8,000 RPM, and maybe give the LS3 in the test a run for its money at the same time. So, join me as I assemble the engine here in my home shop and detail the what, why, and how of everything along the way. Then, we'll turn fuel into horsepower on the dyno and see where we measure up. But first, before I start working on this project, I want to verify the calibration of my tools. I'm starting off by checking my digital torque wrench on Intercom's digital torque wrench tester. I'm checking at a few different torque values, and as you can see in the final tally, the wrench is well within tolerance. Next, I'm checking the calibration of my micrometers. These are brand new Mitotoyos that all have inspection certificates from the factory, but better safe than sorry. I'm using a set of gauge blocks that all have their exact sizes logged to the hundred thousandth of an inch. Following the 10x rule, that's the precision needed to calibrate these mics to the ten thousandth of an inch. However, this wasn't needed since the mics were dead on out of the box. It was time to measure the main journals on the crankshaft. I'll use this to set a base measurement to set the dial bore gauge for checking main bearing clearances. I installed the King P-Max coat main bearings and torque everything down to spec before measuring the ID of the bearings. With everything measuring dead on, it was time to pull it apart, add some assembly lube to the bearings, and then install the crankshaft. Thank you. 
another round of ultra torque on the ARP main studs and the mains get torqued for the final time. For all us 5.0's pistons, we want diamond racing pistons. Uh, as we said in the beginning of the video, uh, this is the only custom part in the entire engine, and that's largely because of the bore size. Uh, we also had them add a small dome to it, so we could reach that 11.3 to 1 compression ratio. And then interestingly, on the ring pack, we actually, because we're, we have a weird bore size, we went to Total Seal and asked them in our bore size what the best off-the-shelf you know, ring pack was. Uh, because that's not a super common size, we ended up with a 1mm, 1.2mm, and 3.0mm ring pack. If we had gone with something smaller like 101020 or you know any, any of their other real high performance stuff, in this particular bore size, we would have been doing a completely custom set of rings. And that would have been quite expensive. Um, again, we wanted off the shelf, you know, not exotic. We're trying to keep this in the realm of, you know, realism here without just, you know, using every cool whiz bang custom part we can. After verifying the piston's diameter at the datum point, I reset the dial bore gauge with that new measurement and check piston to wall clearance. With piston to wall verified, it was time to gap the piston rings. As mentioned before, the ring pack uses a one millimeter gas ported top ring with Total Seal's C33 PVD chrome nitride face coat. The second ring is a 1.2 millimeter reverse twist taper face cast iron ring. The oil control ring is a three millimeter stainless steel set. By the way, can I just mention how much I love this Summit Power Ring Fire? The top rings were gapped at 19 thousandths of an inch and the second rings were set at 20 thousandths of an inch. For LS 5.0's connecting rods, we went with something a little bit special. Uh, these manly H-beam rods are, as you would expect, Forge 4340. They come with a really good uh, 7 16 inch ARP 2000 rod bolt. But one of the cool little features about these rods is they're actually 6300 long. Uh, the standard aftermarket LS rod is 6125 long. Uh, this is originally designed for a tall deck block. However, since we're running the 4.8 stroke, which is the short 3268, uh, we need a longer rod. So this gives us the same extra length in the short stroke combination as a standard 6125 rod would in a normal stroke LS combo. The first step with the rods is to torque them to spec and check the big end housing diameter. Here I'm using a telescoping snap gauge to transfer the measurement to a micrometer. That can give you an idea of swapping around bearings if you have a tight or a loose one in the bunch. After miking the rod pins on the crank, the dowel bore gauge is then set to that measurement. The King P-Max coat rod bearings are installed and the rod bolts are retorqued so that the rod bearing clearances can be checked. All right, so we've run into a small problem. After checking all the rod bearing clearances, we're a little bit on the loose side. Now, normally loose is safe and it's not gonna hurt anything, but it's a little bit bigger than I want. Now, King fortunately offers a set of one thou undersized bearings. The problem is, if I take the full thou out of my clearances, they're gonna now be too tight. So what we can do is take half of the undersized bearing set and half of the standard size bearing set, put one of each half in the rod, and end up with 
half the difference. So that'll only be half a thou taken out. That should put it right in the rule of thumb, which is a thousandth inch of oil clearance per inch of shaft diameter. So let's go ahead and get them swapped out and check our clearances again. After swapping out all the upper bearing halves for the undersized shells, we tightened up our bearing clearances by a little more than half a thou, putting them into a better range for our application. Now it's time to check the wrist pin clearances in the rods. Like before, the pistons are all mic'd and then the dial bore gauge is zeroed on that measurement before checking the clearance of the pin bushing in the rod. With everything checking out okay, I hung the pistons on the rods and locked everything in place with a set of single spiral locks. Then the rings go onto the pistons. Pretty straightforward here. Expander, lower and upper rails, second ring, then the top ring. For this build, we're giving Total Seal's Quick Seat Dry Film Lube a try. One of the things stressed in the instructions is the absolute cleanliness of the cylinders required for the Quick Seat. The final round of cleaning was a good wipe with lint free wipes and 91% isopropanol. While your fingers end up looking like you're covered in anti-seize, it cleans off way easier. From there, we put the piston and ring assembly into one of Total Seal's tapered ring compressors and tap the pistons into place. We used an ARP rod bolt stretch gauge and found that 95 pound-feet of rod bolt torque with ARP's ultra torque lube got us right in the five and a half thousandths of an inch range, so we used that as our target torque. And as you can see, we were dead on. We checked rod side clearance with feeler gauges and found we were right where we wanted to be on all four rod pairs. For LS 5.0, we're going with the Comp LST camshaft. Uh, you might remember a previous article with Ben Strader of EFIU where we went back and forth and spec'd out the cam. Uh, quick rundown of it. It's got 610 thousandths of an inch of lift on the intake side, 617 on the exhaust. Uh, at duration at 50 is 223 intake, 231 exhaust, 112 degree lobe separation angle. So this should get us where we want. Uh, if not, we can switch to either another, a bigger off the shelf cam or something custom, but Ben has a lot of confidence that this is going to be it. Our next step is to get the cam installed in the block and get it degreed. All right, so it's now actually three days later uh, and we had a little, a little oopsie. Um, don't be like me. And if you're going from a Gen 4 single cam bolt to a Gen 3 three cam bolt, forget to pick up cam bolts. Um, so yeah, that was a quick little delay, but now we're back underway. For 
the timing set, we went with Comp Cam's nine way adjustable billet set. This includes a billet upper sprocket riding on a Torrington bearing, a nine way adjustable lower sprocket, and a C5R pre stretch chain. To degree the cam, we utilized one of Proform's crank turning sockets. Besides offering a perfectly sized mounting solution for the degree wheel, it removes the worry of loosening a crank bolt if you need to reverse the rotation of the crank while checking things. The first step is to true up the degree wheel by first setting it to read TDC with the piston at top dead center. Then checking the readings at 200 thousandths of an inch before and after top dead center and making sure they read the same. Then we add a cam lift checking tool which fits in the lifter bore and will give us accurate readings on the cam load. After finding peak load lift, we zero the gauge. Then we record the degree wheel readings at 50 thousandths of an inch before peak lift and 50 thousandths of an inch after peak lift. We add those numbers and divide by two, giving us an installed center line of 106.375 degrees. The cam card calls for a 107 degree installed center line and our timing set changes in two degree increments. So we're calling this good. The Melling high volume oil pump is an easy install, bolting it in finger tight and then turning the engine over to make sure everything is centered up before torquing the bolts to 18 pound feet. The Canton oil pan we're using is designed to work with the OEM windage tray. This is the tray out of the original 4.8 liter engine, with a little elbow grease to get it cleaned up. To align the front and rear covers, we used Mr. Gasket's cover alignment tools and a straight edge to make sure everything was in the right spot. The Canton pickup tube is designed specifically for the rear sump pan we're using. We're also utilizing Canton's stainless oil pan stud kit to mount the pan. We fitted the oil pan with an OEM style filter adapter. After installing the 3 key into the crank, we installed the ATI damper hub, followed by the Monster ARP crank bolt and torqued it to the specified 235 pound feet. Then we installed our ATI super damper shell originally designed for the naturally aspirated competition Kobo engines, so it should work great in this application. And with that, LS 5.0 short block is complete. This video is already a lot longer than expected, so we're going to wrap it up for now. Make sure you're subscribed and have the notification bell turned on so that you don't miss any of the next videos on LS 5.0. If you want to read a deeper dive into the part selection along with a budget breakdown, head on over to enginelabs.com. I'll see you in the next one.